Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Simon. I'm the Chief Business Officer of GEXMD. We have a very exciting agenda ahead as we explore the strategies for financial success in 2024. Before we start, uh, just allow me to do a quick introduction of GEXMD, the company behind the MyTO digital investment platform. GEXMD was formed in 2018 by two prominent companies, uh, Silver Lake Group, a technology powerhouse in Asia, and Money Design, a company who pioneered robot advisor platform in Japan. GEXMD was licensed by SC in 2019 and subsequently launched the MyTO digital investment platform with the aim to enable investors to achieve financial freedom with the use of technology. The company is run by a combination of Japanese and Malaysian expertise, as you can see from the photos below. And with over seven years of experiences in both Japan and Malaysia market, um, the investment platform has attracted over 150,000 investors and close to US dollar uh, two billion of AUM. So let's move on to the agenda for tonight. Uh, in basically an evolving financial landscape that we have today, staying informed and staying ahead with innovative solution is the key to optimize performance. In our one hour agenda, we will kick things off by delving into MyTO 2023 performances and also the key success factor that has contributed to our achievement. This will follow by a deep dive into the trend and market dynamics of the current investment landscape. And finally, we will explore the cutting edge tools and technologies that MyTO has incorporated into its portfolio management strategies. Uh, last but not least, a Q&A session for any question you might have. With me today is Matthew Stewart Box. Is the Chief Investment Officer of both MyTO and Money Design. A brief introduction of Matthew. Matthew has over 20 years of investment experiences in managing uh, investment. He was formerly a Managing Director of BlackRock in US and Japan, who specialized in scientific active equities. In his current role, he is responsible for research and management of all investment models, including asset allocation, portfolio construction and trading. Matthew has an impressive list of academic achievement where he has three master degrees in mathematics, economics and international business. He is a fan of football club, a football club, uh, which I think you can ask him later, and he enjoys skiing in his leisure time. So um, without further ado, uh, I would like to pass the session to Matt to run through the first two agenda of tonight. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, could, could you um, share the slides, please? Um, so hang on. Huh? Just give me a second. Just, sorry. Just give me a second. Ah, there we go. That's great. All right. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so good evening, everybody. Um, as Simon said, uh, my name is Matt Stewart Box. I'm the uh, CIO for uh, MyTheo. Um, what we'll do today is uh, we'll look briefly um, back at 2023, uh, have a look at some performance and what was driving the performance. Um, I'll explain briefly uh, our investment philosophy, how we approach uh, investing. And then I'll spend most of the time looking at the current market environment, um, what kind of things are included in consensus, what kind of risks might be out there, and how I think we can approach investing uh, in 2024. So to start off with uh, our performance uh, over the last few years, uh, this slide here shows the performance of our portfolios um, uh, since inception. Uh, we launched MyTheo uh, just over four and a half years ago uh, in 2019. And uh, the first three rows there, growth, income, inflation hedge, show the performance 
of the various parts of my theo since uh, inception. There's maybe two things to, to note on here. Um, number one is you can see the performance in 2023. Uh, we had a, a very good year. Um, all of our portfolios were up in double digit um, performance. These are uh, ringgit uh, uh, figures. And so you can see our growth portfolio was up 18.4%, uh, in income was up uh, over 10%, and inflation hedge up uh, nearly 12%. 12 so um, we'll look uh, a bit later on on the drivers of the, the performance, but it was a very good year, I think, for, for all of our MyTheo portfolios. That's the first point. Um, and so, sorry, could you just go, go back? Uh, and then the second point is, if you look at the um, since launch numbers there, um, you can see all of the portfolios have got good, strong performance uh, since inception, uh, with the growth portfolio, for example, up uh, over 40% since launch. So last year was a good year, and um, we've been doing well, I think, since uh, since launch. Uh, the next slide shows uh, some of the drivers of performance in uh, 2023. Um, and uh, I think the good thing was that, you know, we the drivers of performance came from a, a range of different places. Um, all of the MyTheo portfolios are globally diversified. Uh, they invest in a range of different countries, a range of different markets, uh, a range of different investments. Um, and I think that benefited our performance in 2023. On the equity side, obviously we did well with our exposure to uh, the tech sector, in particular the, the US tech sector and, and growth stocks in general. They had a very strong year last year and uh, my field portfolios have exposure to there and that was a big contributor for us. Um, but it wasn't just equities that did well. Um, we did well in uh, the fixed income area in uh, bonds uh, and in particular um, high yield bonds, relatively high risk bonds uh, and uh, short term corporate bonds also did uh, really quite well in 2023. Um, partly as a result of, uh, I think, perhaps some of the fears of the U.S. Re recession fading a little bit. Uh, but they were also uh, positive contributors for us in uh, 2023. Uh, and then outside of bonds and equities, um, we also benefited from uh, exposure to U.S. real estate. Certainly in the last uh, few months of the year, uh, U.S. real estate has really rallied very strongly. Uh, and that was a good contributor for our uh, inflation hedge portfolio. And also gold prices um, benefited us. Um, they had a very strong year last year, uh, and we have exposure to those also in our portfolio. Um, the currency did also help us a little bit. Um, the uh, Obviously, the ringgit um, did depreciate against the dollar, um, and so that helped our performance a little. But it was only just over 4% uh, came from currency. Um, and so you can see a lot of our performance also came from the underlying US dollar uh, exposure as well. Okay. I'll just mention briefly our investment philosophy, because I think our approach to investing is uh, a little different from uh, some other investment managers. Um, the first point is uh, we use this uh, approach um, called uh, functional portfolios. And uh, the idea here is that investors invest for a, a range of different reasons, a range of different um, objectives. It's not simply they just want to get the fastest, the biggest return possible. You know, for example, people might invest um, with the goal of increasing the size of their assets over the long term, over a long horizon, so kind of long horizon growth objective. That's perhaps the most common objective, but, you know, you can have other obje objectives, things like um, to generate a a steady stream of income. So for example, if you're retired or close to retirement, you might want a, a steady stream of income to pay for your um, living expenses. Uh, or another objective might be uh, to protect your assets, um, in particular, protect the real value of them, protect them from inflation. And that's another perfectly valid reason for investing. And what we've found is that uh, Different people have different investment objectives. And through time, as people get older, their objectives change through time. And so what we do is we don't build one portfolio for to meet um, everybody's needs. We tailor our portfolios to meet the objectives of each individual investor. And so we design portfolios to meet each of those objectives. 
And that's what we call these functional portfolios. The second point is this risk-based approach. Um, the point here is that uh, returns are extremely hard to predict. It's very hard to predict whether, for example, uh, the US stock market is going to outperform the German stock market this year, or, or whether equities are going to do better than bonds. That's a very difficult thing to do, uh, very difficult to predict uh, consistently. And uh, if you get it wrong, um, it can be very costly to your performance. What we've found is that uh, it's better not to try and time the market, time individual markets, but to focus on risk. Risk is relatively easy to predict. And we found that by, by building portfolios that uh, are aiming to meet these objectives in uh, the lowest risk manner gives us the best chance of delivering um, strong returns to our clients. The third point is um, smart beta. Um, I said we take a risk-based approach, but uh, we do aim to beat the underlying index. And, and how do we do that? Um, well, we take advantage of the fact that there are long-run inefficiencies uh, in markets. And these can provide um, enhancements to your returns over the long run. So for example, uh, in the long run, uh, small cap companies tend to outperform large cap companies, um, or low volatility companies tend to outperform high volatility companies. And these are well-known, well-established, well-researched um, inefficiencies. And by using these in our portfolios, we can seek to outperform the underlying benchmark uh, over the long run. And then finally, um, we take a very efficient way of building our portfolios. Uh, all of our portfolios, all of Mytheo's portfolios are built from uh, investment models. And this enables them to be very scalable, uh, very robust. Um, and then we build the portfolios themselves always from ETFs. Uh, and the advantage is there is the, this gives us a very low cost um, structure to our portfolios. Um, but they're also highly liquid. Um, it's very easy to trade in and out of the ETFs at very low cost. And because each ETF can own thousands of different securities, it gives us a very good way of providing diversification and transparency to our investors. So we found this is the most uh, efficient way of building these portfolios. Um, this is the approach we take. Um, but uh, to be honest, this is not unique to my theo. Um, this investment approach is used by a lot of very large, very sophisticated institutional investors around the world, large government pension funds, uh, corporate pension funds. And so, for example, in the US, um, the example I put on here is CalPERS. This is the California uh, Public Employee Retirement System. They use a, an investment philosophy that's very similar to ours. Um, and I think this shows the, the fact that uh, the approach that we take at Mytheo um, has been well tested by a lot of very smart investors. We sometimes get asked, you know, um, how do you select the ETFs to use in Mytheo? And, and that, that's a fair question. There are thousands of ETFs listed globally, um, and we use about 30 or so in the Mytheo portfolios. And uh, we use a very strict um, screening process to screen down these thousands of ETFs to an investable, investable portfolio. And we use things like um, the fact that the ETF has to be following a, a publicly disclosed index. Uh, we don't use active ETFs. Obviously, the ETF must match the objective of the portfolio. But also, we're looking for ETFs that have a reasonable size, um, sufficient liquidity, and a, a low expense ratio. Obviously, costs are very important in the long run. Uh, and so if we can find um, the lowest possible cost ETF um, to provide the exposure, when that we'll usually use that one. And then we check that the ETF is actually doing what it said it's doing. It is actually tracking um, the index closely. And by using these kind of criteria, we can shrink down the universe of ETFs to a more manageable um, 30 ETF or so universe. And that's what we use to build the um, by Theo portfolios. Okay, um, so that's uh, how we approach investing. Um, I'll maybe spend a little time talking about the current investment landscape uh, and what we might be able to expect in uh, 2024. 
So uh, just a reminder that uh, 2023 was a good year for a lot of markets, um, particularly uh, developed equity markets had a very good year. The US did very well, but also Europe, um, Japan had a good year as well. Um, very strong year for um, domestic, uh, for developed market equities. Uh, and many bond markets started to do well, certainly in the latter half of the year. Um, the table here shows uh, the interest rates, the bond yields in various different countries. Uh, and you can see they started to fall in many countries towards the, the end of the year, and this helped um, bond markets. Also, you can see it within commodities, um, oil was down on the year, but um, things like gold, partly a result of um, geopolitical risk, gold had a very strong year, up uh, 13%. So you can see last year was a, a good year for um, many different markets. If we think about the outlook for, for next year, first off, if you look at it from a, a kind of a uh, underlying economic point of view, maybe if we go to the next slide, um, Yeah, this shows uh, GDP growth. These are the um, figures forecast by the uh, International Monetary Fund, so the IMF. Uh, and they're expecting that global GDP is going to grow by about 2.9% in 2024. So that's very close to what it did uh, last year. In terms of the breakdown, uh, last year was a good year for developed markets, uh, especially the US. Um, the IMF expects uh, developed market growth to slow slightly, you know, the US falling from 2.1 to, to 1.5, um, but still growing, uh, not falling into recession. Uh, and in emerging markets, you can see here, um, the uh, IMF is expecting China to slow slightly from 5% last year to uh, just over 4% uh, this year. Uh, but the big driver of emerging market growth um, is the uh, the strength of India, um, over 6% last year, and uh, the IMF expects uh, that to continue uh, this year. So um, from the point of view of underlying uh, global GDP growth, um, it's not looking like it's going to be a bad year uh, in 2024, even though there are risks, of, of course, in, in uh, individual countries. The main focus at the moment, I think, for, for many investors is the, the recession risk in the US. Um, and if we think back, you know, to early in 2023, um, the consensus was that uh, the US was going to go into recession. I think a lot of people were predicting a recession, given the strength of the uh, inflation in the US and the speed with which the Fed had raised interest rates. The graph on the uh, the bottom right hand side here um, is from uh, Russell Investments. Uh, they produce a, uh, a predicted probability of the US going into uh, recession in the next year. And you can see during late 2022 and uh, most of 2023, the uh, predicted probability ran up um, to over 50%. Uh, we've just seen it just starting to fall as we go into uh, 2024. So now uh, they're predicting a probability of uh, just over 40%. Um, so still uh, uh, a reasonable chance of a US recession, but perhaps slightly lower chance than uh, uh, we've been seeing recently. And behind this obviously is um, inflation and uh, interest rates. Uh, the dark blue line here shows US inflation. Uh, the pale blue line shows uh, interest rates. Um, and this is a pattern we've seen in, in many markets around the world. Uh, inflation spiked during um, uh, 2022. In the US, it spiked at uh, over 9%, uh, the highest rate of inflation for 40 years. And in response to that, uh, the US Fed raised rates uh, in total 11 times, up to uh, over 5%. Uh, inflation has now fallen back, um, so it's now down to about 3% in the US, um, still higher than the, the Fed's long-term target, but certainly much better than it has been uh, a year ago. Uh, and in response to that, um, the Fed has at least stopped for now raising interest rates. Uh, and obviously the indications and the consensus is that uh, at some point this year, the Fed will start to lower interest rates. 
right now the consensus is for interest rates to fall to about four and a half percent uh this year perhaps a little more than that um but certainly most people's um view is that the u.s interest rate cycle has probably uh peaked for the moment so what does that mean for markets well the obvious thing is um it's good for bonds um because of the interest the, the increase in interest rates the yields available on bonds in many countries now are looking really quite attractive um, us uk australia uh, many developed markets uh, the bonds the, the yields available on bonds are looking attractive right now and then if interest rates do fall then the capital value of those bonds um, will increase as well and so you can see a lot of managers are predicting a good year for global bonds. Uh, on the right-hand side, I've just picked out some headlines from some of the outlooks of various different investment managers, and they're all predicting uh, 2024 will be a good year uh, for bonds. But of course, the bond market is very diverse. It's not just US treasuries. Um, every country in the world issues government bonds at different maturities, uh, but there are also corporate bonds, you know, um, investment grade blue chip company bonds, uh, more risky uh, corporate bonds, a whole range of different bonds that are available. Um, this, uh, the graph here is from uh, an asset manager called uh, Pictet, uh, and they've given some predictions for um, what they think different types of bonds might form um, this year. Um, I'm not saying that uh, Pictet's predictions are particularly good or, or they're particularly insightful, um, but it is important to note that there's a range of different outcomes for different types of bonds. Uh, so, for example, they're predicting very good returns, for example, for uh, up at the top there is emerging market local currency bonds. These tend to be relatively risky bonds. And, you know, if the uh, global economy stays relatively strong and interest rates start to fall, they could perform very well. Um, but they also have good predicted returns for things like UK uh, government bonds. Uh, emerging market U.S. debt, uh, various different types of U.S. debt, even China debt as well. And so you can see there's a range of different um, uh, types of bonds that could do well um, in a falling interest rate uh, environment. So that's bonds. Um, how about equities? Um, well, this, this graph here shows um, some of the expectations that people have for equity markets. And so um, it's got a range of different um, markets here. And uh, the blue dot on here is the average expected return of retail investors. And the orange dot is the uh, expected return, the consensus expected return from uh, financial professionals and financial advisors. And there's, there's a couple of points to note here. Um, if you look in the, the middle of that table, that global average, you can see, um, well, in fact, for all almost all of the countries, um, retail investors are more bullish than financial professionals. So on average, um, uh, retail investors are expecting 12.8% uh, um, return uh, from equities, um, but uh, financial uh, professionals are predicting less than that. So there's a 3.8% gap between what professionals are expecting and what retail investors are expecting. And then the second point is uh, right at the top there, uh, there's a very big gap here with US stocks. So retail investors are expecting 15.6% return from US equities, which is certainly possible, uh, but it's very optimistic, I think. Um, and that's basically twice what financial pro professionals are predicting. Uh, I'm not saying that... Uh, the uh, retail investors are going to be wrong and the financial professionals are right. It could be the other way around. But I would say that there is quite a lot of scope for equity investors to be disappointed in 2024. Um, expectations are, are high. The other factor, obviously, is the currency. Um, uh, a lot of people, I think, in many countries are, are concerned about the currency. Um, and the issue is obviously the, the strength of the US dollar. Um, with interest rates rising so quickly uh, in the US, uh, the US dollar has appreciated against uh, many, many different 
currencies. Uh, this graph here shows a kind of a weighted average of the US dollar against uh, a basket of different currencies. And you can see, certainly over the last year or so, um, it's gone up. It's relatively high compared to its history. Um, it's fallen back a little bit recently. Um, but I think there's a couple of things to note here. Um, one is if you look at over, over the long history, well, the dollar is relatively expensive, but it's not um, completely out of line with its uh, historical uh, levels. It is relatively expensive, but it's not um, excessively expensive relative to its history. And then perhaps the second point to think about is in what kind of scenarios would the US dollar weaken significantly? And probably the most likely scenario for that to happen would be that uh, US inflation falls sharply uh, and the Fed lowers interest rates quickly. Um, that might lead to the US dollar um, falling. But it's very dangerous just to think of currencies just on their own. Um, Currencies, inflation, interest rates, asset prices, they're all interlinked. And in that kind of scenario where US inflation falls fast and US interest rates fall, fall fast, that's likely to be a very positive scenario for bonds in particular, uh, but also probably for US equities. Um, and so uh, certainly the, the, in that scenario, the US dollar might weaken. But the underlying US dollar assets themselves are likely to have a very strong return. So uh, I think it's dangerous just to focus on um, the currency just on its own. Um, you've got to think about the different scenarios and how they might play out with uh, different assets. So that's kind of the kind of um, expectations and uh, potential outlook for, for 2024. Um, I'd just like to mention perhaps two uh, risks for um, uh, the global economy and, and global financial markets. Um, and these you know, are starting to have more impact, I think, in the, in the real economy and in pricing of risk. And obviously the first one is climate risk. Um, this graph here shows the average of global temperatures over the last hundred or so years. And uh, two points to make, obviously, you know, 2023 was the hottest year globally since records began. Um, and you can see gradually uh, temperatures are, are rising. And we're now at a point where, you know, average temperatures are about one, 1.2% 1 higher than they were over the last century. Um, that's not a huge difference, but it's enough to trigger um, a lot of very severe weather events. And so if we look at the next slide, this is, um, this is showing through time the number of large climate-related events that have happened, uh, in particular in the US in this graph. Um, and so you can see, obviously, through time, uh, the number of events has increased. Um, it shows the different types of events, things like droughts, wildfires, flooding, freezing, um, heavy winter weather, severe storms. And you can see various of these categories are increasing. Um, the green bars there, that's probably the ones that's increased most, that's some um, severe storms. Um, and that is starting to impact um, the real economy. Obviously, you know, um, a large number of severe storms obviously affects um, agriculture uh, quite directly, uh, agricultural production. Um, but it also affects uh, real estate, um, damages to real estate, um, infrastructure, um, it can damage uh, supply chains, and then it could also damage uh, the financial sectors through um, bank loans and through insurance claims, things like that. So these increases in uh, extreme weather events are starting to have uh, a real impact on um, the economy, um, not just in the US. Um, and I think we have to take that into account as one pot potential risk um, going forward for uh, 2024. And then the second risk, um, obviously, is uh, geopolitical risk. Um, I think most people would agree that um, geopolitical risk uh, has risen over the last two years. Um, it's harder to quantify geopolitical risk. Uh, you know, it's, it's harder than kind of climate change to quantify. 
Um, but uh, what I've shown on here is this is a very common index used by the um, the US Fed for um, geopolitical risk. And it's a, it's a te text-based um, measure. Uh, it uses um, data from newspapers and media uh, about um, terrorist events, wars, and threats of um, violence, things like that. And you can see it moves through time. Um, the spike in the past there was uh, right in the middle there in 2001. Obviously, that was the uh, terrorist attacks in 9-11 uh, uh, in, in the US, and then subsequently uh, invasion of uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, further back in uh, 1991, uh, that was the uh, the first Gulf War. So that was Iraq invading Kuwait. And then you can see on the right-hand side the spike there um, in uh, 2020. Uh, to uh, which was uh, Russia's invasion of uh, the Ukraine, and then a more recent spike, uh, probably linked to uh, the Middle East. And so you can see, um, even though geopolitical risk is not at the same levels as we saw, for example, after 9-11, it's certainly high relative to the last 20 years or so. Uh, and obviously the danger is that um, any one of these risks, Ukraine, the Middle East, uh, Taiwan, um, could uh, spread uh, and lead to uh, material impact on the global economy, either through supply chains, um, energy prices, food prices, and things like that. So I think we have to take into account um, geopolitical risks, certainly um, over the next year or so. Well, how do you de deal with things like that? Um, well, one, one impact that we have seen is um, Related to kind of the climate change risk, we have seen a gradual increase in uh, investors' interest in uh, ESG, so environmental, social, government-related um, strategies. Um, the graphs on, on the on the left-hand here side show um, the total AUM globally um, invested in uh, ESG assets, um, and you can see as, as a share of total AUM, it's still less than 10%, but it's gradually rising. It's up to just under 8% uh, of total assets. Um, this is still mostly focused on uh, European investors. They tend to be the most active in ESG, um, but we have seen it gradually shift um, also uh, attention to um, some other countries such as um, uh, parts of Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand also getting interested in it. And of course, with my Theo, um, we do have an ESG version of our growth portfolio, um, which has the same expected returns, the same expected risk as our as our regular growth portfolio. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in investing in ESG um, strategies, that's a uh, one way of um, doing that. So, how should you be, be positioned for twenty twenty four? As I said, um, at Mythea, we don't try to predict individual countries, individual assets. So uh, I'm not going to give you a list of um, uh, securities that you should buy. Uh, but there are some kind of general principles, that I think, that uh, are relevant for uh, investing in 2024. The first one is uh, stay invested. Um, I know it's tempting when there's uh, risks in the market, and we've talked about uh, various different kinds of risks. It's tempting to want to kind of... Um, step out and wait until risks fade away. Um, this is not a good uh, strategy, um, partly because you never know when these risks are gonna, are gonna fade. You never go, never know when the market is gonna rally. And uh, if you try to time the market, uh, the most likely outcome is that you'll miss that rally. Um, and so um, we do certainly do recommend staying invested um, uh, during uh, the whole year. And then focus on the long run. Um, you know, in the short term, our markets are always going to be volatile. There'll be markets that are up, markets that are down, assets that do well, assets that do badly. But the point is this short-term volatility tends to even out over time. Um, and you're better off focusing on uh, a long-term uh, investment horizon. Uh, and don't worry too much about short-term volatility. Just be aware that in the long run, it, it tends to even out. But in order, in order for that short-term volatility to even out, you have to be diversified. Uh, that means being diversified by country, 
so invest in a range of different countries uh, by asset class, equities, bonds, real assets. They'll all perform differently in different environments. Also be diversified uh, across sectors. Uh, you know, we've seen the US market in particular has been very narrow uh, last year with, you know, uh, stocks like uh, Facebook and, uh, and Tesla, the Magnificent, Magnificent Seven doing so well. Um, but it's very dangerous just to focus your investments on a narrow sector. And then also stay diversified by time horizon. Um, what I mean by that is it's very dangerous to put all of your assets into the market at one point in time. You're much better off, if you can, to invest a regular amount of money, for example, every month uh, in your portfolio. That means that you know if, if the markets fall, then as long as you keep on investing, um, you'll actually benefit in that um, your investments, uh, as you make them, will be able to buy more assets when the market is down. Um, this is a very good way of um, uh, spreading your um, uh, time horizon risk and lowering the volatility of your portfolio. And finally, you might want to, uh, to consider thematic investing. Um, so I mentioned uh, climate risk and uh, geopolitical risk um, as certainly things to be um, aware of in 2024. And uh, my Theo does have a, a, a strategy um, called the Essential Products Strategy, which is a way I think of um, investing, um, perhaps not all of your portfolio, perhaps a, a por portion of your portfolio um, in uh, a strategy that may well be um, resilient in the case of those kind of risks. So I'll just spend a couple of minutes explaining what that strategy um, is and, and what it aims to achieve. Um, so we call it essential products. Um, and what it does is it focuses on um, three things that are essential for, for life, or things that uh, everybody needs. And those things are water, food, and energy. And the idea here is, you know, whatever happens to the global economy, um, whether we have a a soft landing or a hard landing in the US or China or wherever, people are gonna need water, they're gonna need food and they're gonna need energy. Um, and so by investing in a strategy that has exposure to these three um, essential products, um, at least conceptually, you should have uh, some diversification benefits and, and resilience in your portfolio um, if some of these um, climate risks or geopolitical risks do flare up. So how does the essential products um, strategy work? Well, what we're doing is we're, we're taking advantage of what we think of as a long-term demand supply imbalance in these products. If you think about on the demand side, um, obviously global population is still growing, um, uh, gradually growing, uh, and this is a natural um, increase in demand for these kind of products. But on top of that, um, as countries uh, develop economically, um, then uh, people start to demand more of these products as well. And so even in countries where the population is not growing, um, economic growth can also trigger um, increased demand for water, for food and energy. And so there's a very long term, strong structural increase in demand for these products. But on the supply side, uh, there are quite a lot of supply problems. Um, obviously, some cl climate change uh, can cause significant disruption to water supplies, uh, to food supplies, uh, even to energy supplies. And then geopolitical ris risk, we've seen that have a very strong impact on uh, the energy sectors uh, and, and food over the last couple of years. Uh, and so, we can see this kind of um, demand supply imbalance um, providing a driver for increased prices across these kind of sectors. This strategy doesn't invest directly into physical water or food or energy. We don't trade those particular commodities. What this strategy does is invest in companies that are active in these sectors. And the idea here is by investing in companies rather than the commodities, you can benefit in two ways. Um, firstly, you benefit from this underlying demand supply imbalance because these companies will see demand 
uh, and the prices for their products rise. But then secondly, you'll also benefit from the technological advances that these companies make and the, the business model transformations that they make. Obviously, these companies are finding new ways of um, solving problems relating to supplying water and food and energy. And by investing in these companies, you can also gain from these kind of technological advantages or these technological developments. Uh, and so uh, we launched this um, this product uh, at the end of last year. Um, it's uh, an optional portfolio within Mytheo. As I said, um, uh, we wouldn't recommend this as your sole investment strategy. You could think of the regular Mytheo as your core investments. And then you could think of uh, a strategy like essential products as a, as a, a supplement or, or a satellite portfolio that can provide hopefully some um, risk mitigation um, in the case of uh, climate or uh, geopolitical risk. Um, I'll, I'll stop here and, and hand it back to, to Simon, but I'm, I'm very happy to take any um, questions or anything like that, um, um, perhaps when we get towards the end of the session. Thanks, Matt, for the insight on the current investment landscape and also the investment philosophy behind uh, Mighty Exceptional Performance last year. Uh, well, it seems that diversification into multiple asset classes globally has proved to be a winning formula in the last couple of years, during which uh, we witnessed uh, the global economic growth was transiting from a period of strong post-COVID recovery to a gradual slowdown on the back of rising inflation, uh, rising interest rate, as well as uh, rising geopolitical risks. And my TO functional portfolio, which uh, provide investor exposure to diverse range of asset classes globally, have helped investors navigate uh, the economy slowdown uh, thanks uh, partly also to the uh, resilient investment philosophy, which focus on uh, risk reduction as well as uh, efficient implementation via ETF. While 2024 outlook is clearly an important question on top of everyone's mind, like, like what Matt said, trying to predict the future has proved to be extremely challenging. Instead, uh, let's uh, shift our focus to what truly matters to you. Uh, when it comes to investing, uh, we recognize that your uniqueness uh, should take center stage. What are your investment aspiration, time horizon, and your risk tolerance? Uh, These questions form the heart of my tier investment philosophy as we aim to create a portfolio that align with your unique needs. As a cutting-edge uh, digital investment platform in the market, MyTeo basically goes beyond what traditional investment platforms are able to offer. At the heart of MyTeo approach is the seamless integration of artificial intelligence, exchange-traded funds, and also human expertise. And all these forces combines to redefine portfolio management. So what do we mean by elevating portfolio management to new height? These are the four key features of what we think investors are looking for. A stress-free or a fully automated experience, a personalized investing uh, or investment strategy, or a portfolio that is uniquely yours, and the ability to capture global opportunities, as well as tools that can help you plan and visualize the journey ahead. These features uh, work in harmony to provide you with a smarter and smoother investing experience. Just allow me to spend a couple of minutes on, on each features. Uh, Mighty Fully Automated uh, Features is designed to transform your investing experience into a stress-free and enjoyable journey. Gone were the days where clients need to go through a lengthy onboarding process, a bias investment selection, and also the need to manually monitor and rebalance your investment portfolio. With our proprietary algorithm-driven investment selection, as well as our AI assist risk monitoring, this will ensure your investment portfolio are optimized regularly in order to achieve your financial goal. And next, at MyTeo, we do not believe in one-size-fits-all approach, just like a well-fitted suite. A suit. A personalization is crucial aspect of investing. And to do that, we assess your unique investment needs, starting from your age, retirement status, 
your asset level, your risk tolerance, and also your investment horizon. And MyTail algorithm would then provide you with a personalized allocation across the three functional portfolios, the growth, in inflation, uh, income, and inflation page. And in fact, we have over 228 portfolio combination to reflect the specific needs of an individual. I think this is only made possible with digital investment platform. And moreover, your MyTail portfolio will also be automatically adjusted to reflect the change in terms of our age every year. And therefore, it is a truly tailor-made portfolio that will better reflect your need. And third, investing globally, we know that can provide a host of benefit. And my core portfolio consists of three different functional portfolio. And together, these three different functional portfolio provide exposure to multiple asset classes globally, multiple markets, and also multiple industries and sectors. And besides that, investor can also add satellite portfolio that focus on specific team, like what Matt has mentioned, such as, such as the ESG team, as well as the essential product team, which can actually allow investors to align their investment with their values or seize investment opportunity in specific sector or teams. And last but not least, this is the feature that I think I, I, I think is the most important when it comes to achieving financial success. There's a saying that failing to plan is planning to fail. And investment planning it plays a critical role in achieving one's financial goal. As financial goal typically require time, discipline, and also consistent effort to achieve. And setting and reaching financial goal is basically a gradual process that involve planning, savings, investing, and sometimes making adjustments along the way. With our plan ahead feature, we make powerful planning easy. You can see where your finances are headed in just two easy steps on our simulator and also implement your plan in two ways, either through lump sum or regular investment. So these four, these four key features we believe will empower investors to nurture a sound investing habits and also to maintain the discipline that is essential for success in the ever-evolving landscape of investment. I'd like to encourage you to try, try our new app to experience a smarter and smoother way of uh, investing. We'll now move to Q&A session. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. So... Um, Please uh, use the, the Q&A button uh, on the uh, bottom menu bar uh, to basically uh, post any question that you would like to uh, ask. Okay, so uh, we would like to just uh, read out the question. Uh, we have a few questions here. Um, so the first one is uh, Matt. So, um, the question goes, uh, why have the advanced economy, uh, i.e. US and Europe, mm. has been so resilient? And will it last? And would emerging market stand to make comparatively higher gains? Mm. Uh, yeah, it, it's a very good question. Very good question. Um, so it's, it's certainly true that um, from a, an equity market return point of view, uh, the US and Europe had a very good year last year. Uh, there's maybe two things to note um, about that. One is um, what we've seen is companies, certainly in the US, but also in Europe as well, companies have been very good at passing on the costs of inflation. Um, so they've been able to take the rising input prices and in various different ways, pass those prices on to consumers. And so inflation has um, actually helped the profitability of many companies in uh, the US and Europe. And so we've seen corporate profits, regardless of what's going on with GDP and whether it's going to be a recession or not, what we've seen is that corporate profits, uh, certainly in developed markets, have been uh, very resilient. And uh, will that last? Um, well, I don't think corporate behavior is going to change. Um, what could squeeze them is um, wage pressure. Um, certainly in the US, uh, the, the labor market um, is still very tight. 
um, and there is still a put pressure on wages. Um, but unless that really starts to push into uh, profit margins, then uh, I would expect um, developed market profitability to remain strong. Um, the other thing that's been driving, obviously, um, especially US um, returns, um, has been um, expectations, certainly to do with tech-related stocks. Mm. Um, this, this idea that um, a small bunch of large, in particular US companies, are going to benefit from implementation of AI um, has led to... Um, Companies like Microsoft, um, the value of that um, rising very sharply. That's uh, the jury's still out as to whether um, that's those expectations are really justified. Um, it's I think it's too early to set tell, um, but there's certainly quite a lot, very uh, large amount of expectation already built in to prices of those kind of stocks. In terms of emerging markets, um, I think. Uh, emerging markets certainly look attractive from a relative valuation uh, point of view. Um, so they are cheap relative to um, developed markets. And at some point, that um, valuation gap is likely to get resolved. Um, the question is, when would that happen? And what would be the trigger for that to happen? Um, and uh, I don't see an immediate trigger for that um, valuation gap to be resolved. Um, so I wouldn't say that um, there's an immediate opportunity to um, go overweight emerging markets. Um, but I, I would say that at some point, that kind of valuation gap between developed and emerging markets is likely to, to get resolved. Um, and so you certainly do want some exposure to uh, emerging markets. Um, so when when you touch on the uh the outperformance of the tech sector, especially from the uh magnificent seven, right? So uh, there's this next question um that asks about uh whether U.S. uh defensive or value stocks, i.e. consumer staples, healthcare, energy, utilities, will make a comeback this year after you know uh the 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 the, the, the mm -hmm. gap you know that they had with the magnificent seven. Yeah, sure. Um, so this kind of um. Uh, this kind of uh, difference between defensive and um, growth stocks um, is very difficult to uh, very very difficult to predict. Um, and so, let's be honest. You know, uh, growth stocks. It's not just last year that they've outperformed. Um, they struggled in twenty twenty two, but over the last five six years, um, for example, Nasdaq has way outperformed um, the the general S and P, uh, and in particular those kind of uh, Magnificent Seven or, or whatever, those stocks have um, performed, outperformed for a long period of time and by a very large amount. Um, at some point, you know, that has to um, get resolved, um, but uh, it's very difficult to predict when that would happen. So I certainly wouldn't say that you should expect this to flip um, within the next 12 months. It could go on for another 12 months, it could go on for another two years, who, who knows? Um, but it is true that in the long run, um, you know, defensive stocks, um, uh, value stocks um, do provide a good return. Um, and so you certainly want to keep them in your portfolio. I don't think you want to take a big bet of growth relative to value. I think you want both of those in your portfolio right. um, because it's very difficult to predict, you know, which one is going to outperform at any particular point in time. Yeah. yeah, and um, there's this um question um in terms of maybe more specifically on Chinese equities, mm. uh, which had a bad year last year. Um, where do you think Chinese economy is heading this year? Uh, given that the challenges that it it is uh bringing forward to this year. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is a, a a very common kind of question, and certainly you know Chinese equities have have struggled. Um, if you think about um. The underlying economy, uh, well, consensus growth for Chinese GDP is about 4.6% for this year. Uh, the IMF, I think, is a little bit more pessimistic, but they still have 4.2% as their prediction for Chinese GDP growth. So um, certainly that's lower than you know we've seen over the last 10, 20 years or so on average, but it's still a very respectable rate of growth. And you have to remember that 
the Chinese economy has been growing very fast for a long, long time. And the Chinese economy is now very, very big. It's the second biggest economy in the world. It's $18 trillion economy. It's impossible for an economy that size to grow at 10% every year. It just, it just can't happen. And so uh, just because the, con the economy has been so successful and the, the economy has got so big in China, it's natural that growth has to slow. Um, and so from my point of view, you know, um, growing 4%, um, obviously the government target say is, is 5%, that's not a bad outcome uh, at all. Uh, that's still strong growth by anybody's measure. Um, I think the, the 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 issue that we have is going from such high levels of growth to even levels of about four percent means a lot of structural changes to the economy. And yeah. you know, obviously, the the the, 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 the 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 biggest one that we're seeing at the moment, obviously, is the real estate sector, yeah. um, and, and uh, all the news with, with people like um, Evergrande and, and things like that. Um, but what we're seeing is the, the, the structural changes that have to happen to the Chinese economy as it shifts from 10% growth per year to 4% growth per year. And the question is whether the, 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 the Chinese government can manage that transition so that we get a, a smooth um, landing. Um, on the positive side, you know, the, the um, Chinese government has a lot of potential firepower in terms of um, scope for stimulus. It has huge foreign reserves. Um, it's a, it has a, a good position from a fiscal point of view. So it has plenty of scope to take action. Um, I think the, the worry is obviously that problems in uh, the real estate sector can easily spread to um, the financial sector, obviously, and then more broadly to uh, consumer confidence and things like that. Um, and so uh, I think the big question here will be how the Chinese government manages this transition from very high growth to medium high growth. Um, cool. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, well, that's probably not an easy one. Um, the next one, I think, is something that you have touched on just now uh, with regards to the geopolitical uh, tension that's happening in Russia, uh, Middle East and Taiwan, right? Uh, how would the investment landscape evolve? Uh, should we invest more in commodity like gold or should we stick to our plan and maintain our focus on S&P and, uh, and equities? Mm, yeah, so um, this is a very, very good, good, good question. Um, and so just to be clear, you know, we have uh, all, all of the Mytheo portfolios have exposure across a range of different assets. So they're not solely in equities or, or solely in, in bonds. Um, uh, obviously the, the, the ratios will depend on the, on the needs of the client, um, but uh, all clients have some exposure to commodities and things like that. Um, I think you know, a, a, a spike in geopolitical tension um, would be positive for obviously for gold. Um, but uh, if you think about, you know, um, last year we've seen rising political, uh, rising geopolitical risk uh, around the world, and yet a very strong environment for equities. Um, and so it's possible for both equities and gold to to go up at the same time. That's certainly not in, in, impossible. So it's not a simple case that um, a spike in geopolitical risk is negative automatically for for equities. Um, yeah. It raises the risks. Um, and especially, I think, given the case that um, expectations are quite high for equities, um, I think it's quite um, quite risky. Um, but I think uh, in this kind of environment, especially, you do want to keep diversified. Don't keep everything in any one asset class or any one country. Um, and so broad diversification, certainly this year, I think is, is the way to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think last two years has been the case as well. So, uh, mm. well, I, I guess this year, the, probably the safest bet is to be diversified as well. Um, the last question um, is about Bitcoin. Mm. Mm. Do you think the interest in Bitcoin as an investable asset will rise or drop over the long term? And with the conventional investor given uh, is wider availability as an ETF now? Yeah, sure. Um, I think this is a very, very good question. Yes. Um, so uh, I think in terms of whether this will, uh, interest will rise or drop uh, over the long term, 
um, I think, likely to to rise. You, you've seen, obviously, the, the move in the US um, to recognize it as a, as a security. Um, uh, obviously, Bitcoin is the most um, widely known, but there are other, um, you know, uh, uh, these kind of um, uh, currencies. Um, right now, we don't include um, uh, cryptocurrency within uh, Mytheo. Um, I think right now it's they're still too volatile, and the underlying source of the returns is yeah. still, I think, unclear. I think um, in terms of intrinsic intrinsic value, um, intrinsic um, expected returns. So it's very difficult to uh, in, include these kind of cryptocurrencies right now in in, in portfolios because it's very difficult to come up with a sensible measure of their risk and a sensible measure of their likely long-term returns. But having said that, I think investor interest will gradually rise and we'll gradually get a better view as to kind of what the real underlying um, dynamics of cryptocurrencies are. Right now, they're so volatile because of the regulatory environment and because it's so, they're still relatively new. And given time, we'll have a better understanding of the true underlying risks of, of cryptocurrencies. And then I think we'd be able to incorporate them into to my theory. Um, but certainly uh, at the moment, I think it's too early to include them as a, uh, a major part of your portfolio. Sure. Um, thanks, Matt, for addressing the Q&A. So I, I think we, we need to uh, wrap up. It's already nine o'clock. So perhaps just let me just uh, summarize with three key takeaway. Um, so the first one is um, 2023 performance has been uh, achieved uh, on, on the back of a robust investment philosophy, as well as uh, nimble implementation uh, via ETF. So um, I think that that, that philosophy uh, is, is something that um, we should have, you know, in this kind of environment uh, to ensure that we can consistently perform and, and achieve our financial success. And second is um, the outlook for 2024 seems to be a, a little bit more toward the positive side, but uh, like what you, uh, Matt, you have shared is, 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 is uh, better to stay diversified um, because this environment could actually benefit a wider range of assets and uh, essential products uh, could actually act as a shining uh, portfolio you know, to defense against the, the risks that you mentioned, the climate change, as well as the geopolitical risks. And um, I think last but not least is uh, we need a platform to implement our investment strategy. And, and MyTior, with the four key principles, uh, will help to nurture a sound investing habits and maintain the discipline that are essential for success in this uh, ever-evolving landscape of investment. So uh, that concludes uh, the session for tonight. I would like to thank uh, Matt for your sharing and also to all our audience who has been with us for the last one hour. So uh, we would uh, try our best to, to organize another session after this uh, to speak to you guys again. Thank you very much and good night.